today we are going to talk about a very important topic uh what is cloud computing right so everything in this four week webinar constitutes to how do you secure your ci cd pipeline in a cloud environment and the main reason why we have selected in this particular pattern is typically most of the organizations are running their web applications or their services online and how do you go about and how do you secure it different components of it right so predominantly we started off week 1 with security awareness because a lot of people will not be aware of what are the security jargons and what exactly it means into that uh, that was done in the second week we went in deeper into pen testing uh, infrastructure security how do you do that what are the different stages in it and then we saw that were the openings in that in that particular profile right and last week we went deeper into how do you secure a devops environment the reason why we are doing cloud security is that where is this devops or devsecops environment usually hosted in current generation right so most of the time it will be hosted in the cloud environment there is a certain surge in recent times a lot of companies are moving away from cloud and moving towards on prem servers right but i think it's only the larger organization who have been heavily invested in the cloud are moving out of it but when it look into the smaller or medium size organization they'll be still be more you know being based on of cloud itself right there are very certain specular reasons why this happens out there right one of the reasons why there's a cloud the reduction is because the computation is getting very cheaper but as we go further the cloud is also going to get much more cheaper and again the flow going to be back from on prem to the cloud environment even though a lot of customers are going down the amount of new customers are getting into cloud environment is quite high and especially when this cloud providers like gcp aws and azure are predominantly increasing their cloud presence in previously it was more towards in europe and us and now as you are seeing them they are moving towards africa in middle east asia and everything they have increased in their presence and we'll see continue to see the growth in those pattern right so but you might ask me before we go further you know a lot of you might have heard what is cloud computing it is the thing and everything so what do you mean by cloud computing what do you mean by cloud computing and i also told something called as on prem service server right so what is the difference between the two right in simple terms what we can tell is someone else's computer right someone else's computer is let's say i'm having a very good server what i will do is that i'll connect my server to the internet and i'll tell people if you want to run some services or let's say someone wants to only use the server for a couple of days because they are scientists and they are doing analytics and they need the server only for a couple of days since they are only using for a couple of days they don't want to invest in a new server which is very expensive right that's going to be so it's like you don't want to buy a car but if you want to travel out probably you're going to rent a car out there just for the travel and then come back that's the main reason of it right but here right so this is in the simplest term that is what so someone else computer is using out there but when you're doing in a large scale environment the complexity goes beyond that right when you're de dealing with millions of customers millions of servers out there and how do you connect them how do you isolate them you no know, all those things that came to very important criteria into that part right one of the main reasons why people move to cloud is cost right the main thing is that let's say think about you are a small organization and you are starting new right you are working somewhere and you want to start your own company what is going to cost you if you want to start your own company right so if you are not going with cloud if you are going with on prem server meaning you are buying a server and putting in your office what is going to happen you have to pay rent for the office you have to pay very high amount for the servers servers are very expensive to start off with and again they need to have a maintenance the electricity ac ka you know cooling for them and, and then again an administrator has to be there for maintaining them all the cost is going to be very high the initial cost is very high when you going to cloud in when you going on prem 
right? If you're using a cloud environment, all you need, probably you can start it from your house, your company, and you just need a credit card to purchase your instance on AWS, and here, there you go, right? As the business grows, you can keep on investing more and more into that. It is not that you're doing a huge investment in the start, and then it's going to pay that, right? And one more advantage is that the cost of maintenance, you don't have to worry about maintenance because someone else is maintaining it for you. The AWS, AWS GCP, Azure, Microsoft are managing the services for you, right? And they also provide you better uptime, right? So the chances of backups and when it comes to compliance requirements, it plays a very important role. A lot of companies sticking to cloud especially in the organization I work with, even though they have an option to go on-prem, but they still choose to go with cloud because they provide a better security. At the same time, there's something called as a compliance. It is better manageable out there when it is on cloud, right? There's a lot of uh, responsibility shifted to that. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about it out here, right? So now, before we go, Right? Who is responsible and the user or the cloud provider? Before we talk about this, we need to talk about three types of services that a cloud service provides. One is IaaS and IaaS, infrastructure as a service. One is platform as a service. Another is Sorry, you are muted. I think, uh, yeah, sorry. for how long I've been muted for the entire thing? No, no, just, just, uh, one, one minute or so. Okay. Okay. I think there's some issue with the Microsoft is teams is behaving differently. Thank you. Thank you for your info. So before we go into who is responsible for the security in a cloud environment, we need to understand what are the different types of services provided by the cloud provider, right? One is uh, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service, right? These are the three things that comes into play. In software as a service, you're given a software, right? You're just going to use it, and then you're going to pay for that particular part. A simple example for this is going to be your Gmail access, right? If you're an enterprise, you want to have a mail access to your employees, you're going to connect with Gmail and they're going to give in G Suite for that, right? You're going to have a Google Drive and everything. You are not managing anything out there. You just have to set up. Everything is going to be taken care by Google itself, right? In a platform as a service, what is going to happen is that predominantly what we see in your AWS instances out there, you are going to create an instance, but you're going to give an access to the complete platform, meaning you can choose which operating system you're going to run. You can choose which uh, software you want to run, what uh, selection, in what order you want to install it. And all those things are going to be under your control. In software as a service, you don't have any other control of that. You just have access to the user interface and nothing else. There are certain settings you can do, that is again at the application level, meaning you can go there and then you'll have a web interface, you can do setting configurations out there, but you have no idea what operating system it is running out there, which software language is being used out there, and what is the code, you don't have any access to that. Right? In a platform as a service, you have access to the operating system. You can do play around a lot more into that. But one place you don't have access is the infrastructure, meaning the hardware part. You don't, you can't control a physical server, physical hard drive, physical network. That is not going to be managed by you. That is going to be managed by your cloud provider, right? That is your AWS. Infrastructure as a service is very, very uncommon, right? Because this is going to happen not for small amount of components, right? You have to have a significant investment inside that part. So what is going to happen here is that the complete infrastructure, they are going to give you probably 500 on a bare minimum, 
right? On a bare minimum, you're going to be given access to 500 or 1000 servers. You are going to completely manage them and everything. Only thing they're going to give you is that the resource pool, right? This everything is been uh, put in a rack and you're connected to that network is in place and everything. But you will have to manage everything out there, right? What is the IP address? What is the what servers are there? What is the chips out there? What is the RAM installed? What is the hard drive installed? What is the process is running? And all those things are going to be there. And this happens for a very large projects, right? Especially when you're talking about private cloud, you are going to be given a complete facility for yourself and everything is going to be managed by them security. But you are going to be dealing with what has to be done with that part. Not no one else will have into that part. Correct. So that's the thing because infrastructure usually what happens you think about if you're running a medium size or a small size company you're not going with infrastructure in running a large size company uh, especially banks when they want to have web services or anything they're running on aws or any and running on the cloud they don't want to share right because in platform as a service that particular server may be serving 10 different customers but infrastructure that is not going to happen a single server is going to belong to a single client and they have complete access. And usually banks would do that because they want to have a better security, right? So now we have an idea about looking here. So there are different ways of doing it. Part. So you can see in infrastructure, I have the client or the user as more control in software as a service client as very less control, right? So now you're, the question comes here is that who is responsible for what if someone gets hacked who is responsible for that right that is the main criteria we have to look into place here right so user or the cloud provider who is responsible for that it depends completely on right it depends completely on what is the service that is being provided right so infrastructure as a service mostly it is consumer and software as a service, it moves towards there, mostly the provider, that is your AWS or Azure is going to be responsible for that. And here you could see, right, there's a lot of different things available out there. When we're talking about on-prem, everything is going to be the customer's responsibility because they are running it on their premises. AWS has no control over it out there, right? Whereas in infrastructure as a service, data classification, client endpoint security, meaning your laptops, other things, servers, and everything, an identity and access managed is going to be responsible from the customer itself. And what access is given to what users will also going to be there, right? So network control here, it is going to be 50-50 and host infrastructure is going to be 50-50. Uh, predominantly, like for instance, infrastructure from a firewall perspective, those things will come under the customer. Whereas a physical security, right? When you go, most of these cloud firms or anything, these places will not have very few servers, right? They will have thousands of servers in that, on you know, very large quantity. And the security will be so high that I think probably it will be as secure as any of the military, top secret military bases out there, you know, on an average, right? So because I was there in one of the engagements where I was pen testing a server for one of the major banks in a cloud environment. I had been through that building for more than 10 years. I never knew that was a cloud firm out there because there is no information about it, right? There's no board outside. There's no banner or anything. And again, before going in, I had to give one week prayer. I have to give my identified verified identity verified i had to give the laptop serial number and things which i'm going to take out there and a very strict restrictions what can be allowed in there right and once you are there there's always someone with you accompanying you doing checking what you're doing out there right that is done by the cloud provider whereas the actually the physical managing that server firewall and removing and accessing those server that is taken care by the client right the physical security is going to be taken by the provider out there platform as a service right so data classification, client endpoint production comes in under client itself, right? So what data is there? How do you classify data and accountability and everything? It's going to be there by them. Access management and identity access management is going to be bit divided by two, right? The main reason is that when you're creating an instance, you are going to decide who's going to have access to that instance. So that particular instance is going to be in the 
cloud itself, right? A server in the cloud form. So that server is again managed by the AWS itself or the cloud provider to be frank. So that's why you see uh, identity access management and application level control is going to be a bit of a divine of them. At the same time, at the platform as a service, they, if you have an instance like an Ubuntu server, they'll still have access to that server in one way or the other because they're running a lot of diagnostics out there. And there are many instances where my clients, where their server was blacklisted because they had not upgraded their OS to the latest patch because there was a vulnerability. They told you have it in three days to four days to patch it up. And again, they had to rush to update the software because that new patch would not allow the software to work properly. Right. So all those things, rest of the things comes in the, the platform as a, you know, cloud provider is going to be there. Right. And software as a service is very, that's what everything is going to be done by the cloud provider itself, except let's say what Gmail, Google Drive access that you're giving out there, uh, who can access which data on the folder that has been managed by you, what mail can be accessed, those things are managed by you, but anything else is under that is going to be managed by the user, right? So my question is now, since we are talking about the distribution, right? We spoke about the distribution of the work, who is responsible for what, right? So let's say you are starting a cloud service, you're predominantly most of the time we are going to be involved in a platform as a service, right? That is where uh, it is going to make more sense into that. How do you know what is required? Right? So what needs to be secured? What is a security best practice? And what is not a security back practice? And what has to be taken into consideration, right? That is what we have to look into that. So in this webinar, is that is what we are going to looking into that. So we are looking at what are the things that needs to be taken into consideration? Where are the things that could go wrong? What are the things that should be present out there? Right? So that is what is going to be there. So let's talk about the one of the main defense mechanisms a cloud provider provides is a security group. You know? A security group acts as a virtual firewall for your instances to control incoming and outgoing traffic. Both inboard and outbound rules control the flow of the traffic and traffic from your instance respectively, right? So think about a virtual firewall as a watchman, right? Let's say you're going to be an, if you're going to an office or in a college, as soon as you, at the gate of the premise, there'll be a security guard checking your identity, right? Only when you pass that identity that you're going to be allowed inside and done, right? Even if you're an employee, you may not be allowed to access a particular building or a particular floor. And that is what basically rule set is going to be there. And that is going to be managed. You know, earlier times, what used to happen was there was this bad security practice they used to allow everyone by default, and we need to enable who can access it at the later stage. That was a security feature available out there. But it got modified because a lot of security issues came in. A lot of people were getting inside the system and things like that. So what they changed it to now is that if anyone wants to access a particular resource on your server or in your instance, they need to be a particular rule set set up out there without that rule set being set up out there, no one will be able to access it, right? So I think only the administrator will be able to access it during the AWS dashboard and work on those things, right? You have to set up the firewall in a particular way. So here we're talking about something called as a whitelist security groups are always permissive. So what do you mean by whitelisting? And what do you mean by blacklisting? Right. So blacklisting is like telling don't allow a particular person, right? Let's say they don't allow a particular person, but rest everyone will be allowed out there. 
So let's say they'll identify a criminal and they are telling don't allow this person. That's the rule set of that. But what's the problem with this particular rule set is that it does not prevent a new criminal from entering because he does not identify, he is not similar to the, the one who is getting blocked, so he's going to be allowed. So that is blacklisting, right? Preventing a particular entity from entering out there. This was a bad idea. So in order to overcome this, they what they did was whitelisting. In whitelisting, what happens is that everyone is going to be rejected. Everyone is going to be rejected. We have to specify who can be inside the organization, right? Inside the server. So a simple example for this is going to be when you create an AWS instance of them, you are going to set up a virtual firewall where it will tell I'm running a website and it is running on port number 443. Open only that 443 for everyone. And when you have an SSH service, open that port number 22 only for the administrator system. No one else is able to access for that. So that is how we can manage this process. Right. So any questions? Till now? Anyone having any questions? No, sir. Oh. So next is a management plane. You know, traditional infrastructure and cloud computing. This is a major significant security difference. You know, all mega structures, but is interface to connect with the mega structures and configuration much of the cloud. So gaining access to the management plane, like gaining unfiltered access to the data center. Cloud provider, including private cloud, must provide high level of availability and mechanism to customer to manage aspects to their own availability. So what do you mean by management plane out here? So management plane here predominantly deals with the place or the dashboard you're managing your instances, right? When you log into your system, log into your AWS, you do, you do have a lot of tools out there which will help you manage your instances. You can start the instance, create the instance, access the instance, all those things. Let's say you are having an, someone gets access to your management plane. What can they do? What can they do out there? They can, you know, they can literally delete all the instances out there or copy the instances, cost or loss of data can happen out there or stop the instances. And this is going to be a huge loss of them. And one of the major problems that is going to be there, why it is important to have a very good security for management is, is very important out there. You know, ensure there's a strong perimeter security for API gateway and web consoles, you know, strong authentication and multi-factor authentication, meaning it should be an organization policies to have a very strong passwords, right? So meaning if you're having an eight character password, probably it will take about 30, 35 days to be cracked. And, pro and it is then that is the reason you need to change the password in once in 30 days. But as you keep on increasing the number of characters, it goes from eight to nine character password, 10, 11 and 12, it becomes extremely difficult, right? I'm talking about today, the password can be cracked about brute forcing perspective. Four billion different password can be tried out to check whether the password is right or wrong. Right. So even after that, if you're having a 12 character password, if you're even having a supercomputer, it is not going to be something you're going to crack in this current generation. Right? Probably it will take you know, thousands of years for that. But similarly, if you take two, 16 character password, it goes much beyond that, right? You no, know, much beyond that. It should be an organization policy to have a 16 character password for admin users or management consoles. And the multi-factor authentication should also have a much higher level out there, right? You might have seen nowadays the multi-factor, the OTP things that you're getting out there. Previously, you're getting only three character or four character. It's been increased to six. For the same reason, it can be brute forced. Right. One of my jobs in when I'm working on, you know, login and testing activity we see is there in any multi-factor OTP based login approach and we'll try to crack it. That, that is going to be very used out there. 
right? Because when you're having three character OTP, it takes me about only thousand different attempts to check it out, right? And if there is no rate limiting kind of a mechanism out there, it takes less than a minute to crack your OTP, right? Then again, you need to divide the roles. A super administrator should not be used for managing day-to-day -day accounts and uh, root primary account holders credentials, right? Disable root privileges on your all your instances out there and make sure who is having access to what activity that has to be managed by you. It is a major problem. It is a major problem. We have seen, right, there are times when the user their servers are getting attacked all the time. And they they come to us telling that we have been changing the password and nothing is working out there. And still they're able to do it part of it. You know? The customer is always thinking that there's some issue with the instances and things like that. The problem, what happened in one of the situations was the administrator laptop was hacked. And they had a complete control over in from his laptop. And a lot of things was happening via that. Right. So it was a multi-level attack that occurred. Uh, so they were able to manage a lot of things because once he's logged in and probably he's gone out for coffee or anything, they can do a lot of activities from there because the credentials are free then in fed out there. So so at that time everything was given access to him. So that was a big mistake. Uh, here it does not mean that when you divide the access control that you're not going to be hacked. You know, the, always the thing about hacking or security is that we have to mitigate the you know data loss or reduce the impact, right? Instead of losing about 100% data, probably if we can bring it down to losing only 5% of data and very irrelevant data, that is also acceptable in some cases. No, we should always, but that should be the case, right? Multi-layer security is going to approach that for them. Next part is going to be infrastructure, right? This is going to be a major issue, right? A lot of the times we have seen they provide a very good management console and everyone is accessing all the time and things like that. But when they create instances, they don't take the necessary precautions to do this actually, right? So what is going to happen is that in some of the instances, what they are going to do is they're going to give access root enable root access to that because it will allow much more easier to brute force the root level access because they know the user is root user and they know how to do it. Uh, they will not have firewall in place, a dedicated firewall at the cloud level, right? Fire AWS do provide a dedicated firewall and the IDPS systems are also not there, you know, where it can detect a particular type of an attack being happened. Understand, if you might have seen in previous lectures, Firewall and IDPS are two different entities. You know, the current generation firewall sometimes has both the features, but we need to have two level of security out there as well, right? So cloud firewall is going to check for the rules only when a particular rule passes, a packet is forwarded. Whereas an IDPS is going to look for patterns. Let's say they're all of a sudden from a single client, I'm getting thousand requests in a single minute. Right. Or in the 10 seconds, I've received 1000 requests. what is happening out there? Is someone trying to do a brute force attack? Right. Is there any for, you know, authentication error message popping out out of my web server constantly? Right. So then probably I need to do anything to that. So this is a lot of pattern recognition. Right. Uh, it's going to be there. Uh, we should also check with, you know, lack of using hashing algorithm for managing the file system. Right? Are we constantly checking whether the data has been manipulated by the right set of people or not? Right? That is going to be very, very useful out there. One more issue. If you have seen Equifax hack, which cost about half of US population social security number was stolen on that attack. Right? So the main problem occurred out there was the hacker was able to hack into the system because there was a, I think, uh, one particular software tool. It had a severe vulnerability where it will give anyone access to the system. And they had known about it and they did not patch it. 
meaning they did not fix it. They did not upgrade that particular version. The main reason for that was when they updated that the application failed. So they were working on the bug fix to overcome before that. And but in the meantime, the hacker got to know that there's a bug out here that can be exploited. They got into that. So that's a major thing that they need to do. And at the cloud level, uh, if you're having an infrastructure, it is a major problem. If you're managing, you have to take care of that again because it is your responsibility in platform as a service it is 50 50 right so sometimes if you're having an instance that you're giving allowing others to use or an image the image is going to be scanned by aws but if you're running an instance chance of it getting scanned and alerting you and doing that's going to be present less okay it is your responsibility to constantly check and make sure it is passed up to date at the same time, manage logs of it, right? Uh, manage logs, who is having access, what access was there. The logs has to be quite comprehensive, right? Because we can give out, there's a lot of logs available out there. Most of the companies will give which system connected to the server at what time and what was the connection was basically about, right? But nowadays it has to be much more aggressive you know much more in depth uh, especially in a SOC environment where you're properly monitoring it you will know what commands an administrator is running on the system all the commands will be logged and stored in a particular place and it will be analyzed right if an administrator is running any kind of an admin related pass, user commands that is again going to raise an Im immediate alert right Anything is if you're running a web server on Ubuntu, any any program or any command run using sudo or run by as a root user, it is supposed to generate an alert immediately because you need to have a pre permission to run certain commands. Right. So those are the things. You know, infrastructure plays a major role. Right. One of the main advantages about infrastructure security when we're talking about cloud is that I don't have to worry about physical security. Right, because if you're having a physical secure physical server at your office, and if you're collecting customer data, banking information, their personal information, PCI DSS mandates that you should keep the server in a closed enclosure. There is a particular lock, minimum lock requirement of the it should not be easily broken. And anyone who is entering and out of the server rooms has to be monitored and logged as well. In physically, someone needs to write on paper or some kind of mechanism where it will tell which person has entered the room. So that you don't have to worry about cloud because that is going to be managed by the cloud infrastructure itself. Yeah, that's one thing. One more thing, what we see is that you know insecure interface and APIs as DevOps and Dev is growing faster. Right, more companies are going towards dividing the application into multiple pieces and having a different API for each of the activities out there. We are seeing, you know, according to Akamai 2000 report document, 29% of the web attacks are targeting APIs. And in the year 2023, the attacks previously web API based attacks were very less. Now it has gone up significantly. Right. So you might be asking why is that we're talking about API when we're talking about cloud? Where are these APIs being right? hosted out there? Right? It's going to be hosted on the cloud itself. And this similar to a web application where it can have some kind of an injection to gain access to the base OS, API can also be used for the same thing out there. Right? What are the problems you're facing in API? Inadequate authentication mechanism, right? Um, here we're talking about there is not enough security measure when you're talking about authentication, meaning what you log into, right? So are you using two-factor authentication? Multi-factor authentication has been used. What is the password approach you're doing? Are you allowing any passwordless approach? You know, for SSH we're using it. Can, we can be using password less, you know, we're using a public key cryptography we can use, which is much more difficult to crack rather than your traditional 
you know, username and password. Are the communication being encrypted or not? You know, that is one of the issues. And improper session management is there and insufficient input validation. So input validation is basically about you're not whitelisting what characters can be sent out there. And I can send a code out there as well. Uh, semicolon and other things, command injection is going to be there. Session management is also there, right? So when the API is connecting, let's say you authenticate to the API, the API should de-authenticate you after a set number of time. If that is not happening, that becomes a major issue. And now the authentication is happening out there. So what we saw in pen testing, this is what is going to be there. And again, poor logging and monitoring, it's not getting, you know, APIs that are there in the cloud are not getting properly logged or monitored. Who is accessing this API? How long the, what is the number of requests processed by this API? All those things are not done out there. And again, API are based out of some software, right? They are running on underlying infrastructure. Are this outdated and patch software updated regularly? And that is very much important. If you remember in the previous session, we talked about DevSecOps. Every time there's an update, right? In the DevSecOps, it is important to check for the patches. That is the main reason DevSecOps plays a major role. And in the cloud, especially it plays a major role because every time some changes is there to the API, it is always going to check is all the software up to date or not. And it is going to scan and make sure of that, right? Uh, assume production par parity during conversions. So how are you converting, how do you transferring from one place to another place? You have to be very careful out there. Overly permissive access control and lack of rate limiting, right? So access control is not done ma'am properly. Anyone who is connected to the system, uh, there's no role-based access control being done out there. So that plays a major issue because uh, certain times, a manager of one department should not have access to the manager data of the other department. That is that cannot happen, out there, right? So, but it may there will be no security mechanism or access control preventing that happen. That is very important to be there, right? Making sure a particular API has access to only certain data, not all the data out there, and lack of rate limiting. Lack of rate limiting. What do you mean by rate limiting? Here is um, when you send in a large amount of data to the server, server should behave in a particular way, right? One thing is to block the user who's sending a large amount of data, meaning we usually recommend to the customers and thing like that for any user on an average 10 requests per minute is allocated, right? Anything more than that, they should block the user, on, right? Depending on the depending on the application, this changes because in certain applications, it is constantly updating, right? It's constantly updating out there. And if every four to five seconds, there's a request sent to the server to get the latest update because they're going to run out of the 10 requests very soon. And sometimes it's going to be almost as as two or three seconds. But on an average, anything more than, in a rare cases, anything more than 100 uh, requests per minute should be taken as an attack and that should be blocked and necessary action taken out there, right? And that may not be happening in the API levels. That is a major issue, right? This can lead to DOS attack, which can lead to the API crashing, meaning the web service will crash and probably you lose a lot of business because of that. Insufficient third party, insecure third party resources, right? So what do you mean from this? Right. Let's say if you're running any kind of a software in your server, what are the things that are, is your only code is only required out there or do we need anything else? Out there? Right. We will need an operating system, right? Let's assume we're running a web server. We'll need an operating system. We'll need a web server that is your Apache Nginx, or in some case, if you're using Python, Django or Flask is needed out there. Then again, for that, Python is also important on there, or PHP or MySQL for storing the database. A lot of these are third party. You're not writing the code for that. You're downloading it either 
you are paying for it or you are having a what do you mean downloading it for free and open source like mysql python is free and probably if you're using ms sql microsoft sql you're paying for it and things like that right so now if there is any problem or vulnerability in this can you do anything about it short answer is no only thing you can do here is either update the product update the security patch that has been given by the resource or you have to stop using that and that happened once for us uh, we were running a particular software in a waf application and that waf application was running on python right so that particular waf that was a new vulnerability that came into python and we the patch they extend the patch to quite a level that they told we were told that if your patch does not come in day after tomorrow you will have to stop using the application right so luckily it came in time that was fixed but a lot of times a big software third party products get patches in time right so meaning uh, your ubuntu server your python your django and those things because there's a lot of developers working out there as soon as they get a patch uh, they get a bug they know how to fix it and they will release the patch immediately right that's going to happen on that but there will be a lot of small third party tools out there rather than big third party tools who will not have the resources probably they might not even know there's vulnerability in them right or even if it is there they will take a long time to fix for the entire duration you have to be with that so that is why you have to be very careful um who is going to be where you are taking that product and tools are for them. predominantly that is why uh, it is always good idea to stick with a very reliable source right so that is why we tell a lot of people will ask or can we use hakali linux for running a server things that we told tell no you should not use it because it's constantly changing there is no security patches in fact, even though I use Kali Linux, I don't use it as my daily driver, right? Probably Ubuntu is a better approach because Ubuntu gets constantly upgraded and patches are fixed on a regular basis. They're quite transparent. If you go to the security uh, page, they will tell which are the new bugs that are available out there and how, when was it fixed and what can be done to fix it out, there, right? So this is the uh, third party resource that you'll see, right? So before going in next, any questions till now? No one has any questions? Okay. Let me check. I think that will be answered by me sir. So that, right? Let me have some water. So next component we're talking about is insecure software development. Sir, after course completion, getting a certificate or not? Uh, that I think probably after this semi um, webinar, we'll uh, Menon sir and the Devis sir will explain you about that. Yeah, so I think you can okay, check sir, out. Thank you. Yeah, you can check out in the WhatsApp group as well. There's a lot of instruction there on how to do that process. Yeah. So, insecure software development deals about this is more about an approach rather than doing something technically out there. Uh, insecure software development is what you're doing out there, how you're developing the software, right? Uh, is the current process of approaching a development of software is right or not, right? Uh, so for instance, all the developers do not intentionally create insecure software, the complexity of the software in cloud can technologies can inadvertently introduce vulnerabilities, right? By focusing on CloudForce approach, organization can facilitate creation of DevOps pipeline, enabling continuous CI/CD pipelines. Could ser service providers may also offer is secure development features such as guardrail. You know, 
guardrail is one of the features that is being given to understand this basically software development process you have many different stages right so you collect the requirement once you have the requirement from the client you are going to sit down as an architect you are going to design what the application should behave like where the buttons what page and how and everything and how they are interacting with them is going to be taken into consideration then we are going to implement the code and then probably test that code and then push it to production you know so that is what is going to happen on them and that is when we pen testers come into play once it goes into production we test it and we will discuss identify all the security vulnerabilities the cycle for cloud pen testing or any application security pen testing is quite not common right not so usually on an average on the bare minimum meaning very frequent we talk about once in 3 months and very rare, rare cases once in a month it is getting pen tested out there, right and sometimes in internal way so in the mental time there is some problem that it is still exposed till the pen testers identify vulnerability hackers could identify the same vulnerability before them and gain access to the system but how do we overcome this using ci cd pipeline right what they are talking about so there are a lot of things that can be done predominantly at the design phase as an architect you know what are the different attacks at an application can face you know it could be rate limiting it could be authentication bypass sql injection xss attack or csrf attack so then at the design phase itself we are going to write down what are the mitigation techniques and you are going to write down the code itself also for that to overcome the security issues what this helps us is that it covers about a large you know almost 100% of security vulnerabilities can be you know prevented by writing a better secure code when you know what attacks are going to come out right main reason softwares are vulnerable is because the software developers will not be aware of what these vulnerabilities are you know to overcome this this is the main approach of them right csd pipelines gives a very important uh, tool set for this out there where you can continuously every time there is a modification in your code you can have the scans done and we'll know how to overcome these situations right so one of the major issues the next major issue is encrypt data it's when it is in transit as well as in rest right this usually nowadays it, it's a bit less but still we see it on the place and again nowadays we don't see plain text data being sent out but we see the data is not using proper authentication right proper authentication is not been done just one second so encryption encryption is way of preventing unauthorized access to data right so let's say whenever you are sending information over web you know when you are accessing gmail or your facebook or instagram whatever you are doing out there you will see a, something called as in https being sent out there right it is using a some form of encryption out there to make sure that the data is secure when the data is in transit meaning when the data is moving from server to the client data is going to be encrypted that's why it's called as a motion or in transit what happens when the data is at rest meaning it's in the hard drive stored in the hard drive right is the data getting encrypted out there and that is also one of the major things that is been improving these days right uh, unfortunately this will take bit more cost increase the cost of managing it because the cpu utilization is going to increase for every time you're decrypting the data and storing the data uh, as in processing the data and then again encrypting it and storing the data right the cost is going to increase but still it makes it is important right this data security is of utmost important for that 
one simple way example you know i'll tell you is here is that why do you think right when you take top executives in all major companies right if you see there's a standard procedure all of them are given iphones right and all of them are given macbooks or thinkpads lenovo thinkpads especially x1 carbon series are going to be handed to them why is that is it that because they are senior executives or important persons in the organization we should give them the best devices of the for the actually no right so what happens is that these devices come with something very built in from day one that is encryption data encryption on rest right anything that is getting stored in your iphone is going to be encrypted it's not going to be you know uh, unencrypted stored in plain text for instance if you take any android phone a low level android phone or some i'm not talking about samsung galaxy s24 or 23 that comes up with some kind of an encryption of them if you take any low level if even though you're logged your mobile someone opens up your mobile breaks into that take the memory chip and push it into somewhere some other mobile and it is going to open up it's going to go all the data out there and same thing with the laptops also, right if you take any normal laptop if data is not encrypted take the hard drive out connecting to a different laptop and use it it's not going to be an issue at all right they'll be able to read through the data completely so a data encryption plays a major role in our day to day process right so especially in the cloud environment the cloud instances the data that is getting stored should be encrypted that has to be very very important right so what do you mean by accidental cloud disclosure So cloud security has been published study into indicating that 21% of public cloud contains sensitive data. You know, there is exit across Amazon S3 bucket, Stellar, you know, Elastic Block Storage, GCP, Docker Hub, Elastic Search, Reddit, and GitHub. So a lot of times, a company private data is stored. Right? When you're talking about cloud, it is not only that. you're giving access to the aws instance or running some kind of a servers right you can also run some kind of a storage service also for instance think about uh, github repository right github is also a software as a service right there it is providing you a place to store your code and manage the version control of it that is a software as a service provided by the github that github is not running in your local premises right it is running somewhere in the cloud environment similarly you what about your google drive you are storing there right that is also a cloud service out there you know s3 bucket is similar to that right what happens is that a lot of time people will administrator by mistake make this s3 buckets public or google drive public or github public in one of the situations we saw uh the application the api was connecting to s3 bucket and when we directly connected to the s3 bucket it opened up and every data was available out there. right that was a critical bug that was introduced you know we did not wait for the test to be completed we immediately called up the customer and tell this data is exposed because the configuration they have not set up the properly settings out there right there are many cases many cases when we test the application it will be properly secure there is very few vulnerabilities critical vulnerabilities or high it's not going to be there at all but when we check out their github repository it will be public meaning all the code that application is based on they forgot to make it private anyone can run because by default in github let's say you have a github account where you put up your code everyone can see it right because it's a uh, free version free version code is not private you have to pay if you want to make your code private meaning only authorized persons will be able to view that view your code this particular organization it's a very big organization they deal with lot of data right they deal with lot of data uh, they forgot to make it private and it was public and this involved because of this it kick started a long procedure for them 
they saw that there was a small modification they moved certain thing or anything settings was modified and it was open for 3 months and this code actually had a password hard coded into that as a couple of passwords hard coded into that so now what happened was they don't know whether anyone gain access to this code or not so first and foremost they change all the passwords then the log series log incidents response uh, they had to analyze a lot of things out there so luckily when we analyze the logs and things we saw that uh, even the code was public no one got to know about it because no one thought they they missed it by a whisker because we got through the log files we saw who is accessing any suspicious behavior and log file line by line every user who has accessed it has to be coming from a company ip address itself anything more that it has to be treated as a breach and nothing was there luckily but that is what happened out there you know the access to these services was not properly done it becomes very major problem it is happening it is happening right a lot of times uh, we have seen an admin dashboard also having the same issues right they they don't change uh, the default username and passwords uh, that's why nowadays you see what happens is that even though the application comes with default user and password when you log in for the first time it forces you to change the password right it forces you to change the password after that uh, sometimes what they do is uh, they change the password with the old password only nothing new on them that is one of the major problems it is not that difficult for hackers to identify uh, someone's password you know there is a difficulty in uh, checking the brute forcing but i can reduce the number of password list from 14 million to few thousand uh, just by checking your so, you know online history meaning looking at your linkedin profile looking at your facebook insta who are your relatives your kids because we do right lot of people will put their kids birthdays online their wife birthday their spouse birthday online and things and all we can collect all this information give it to a tool and it will give us a huge list of passwords which will be far less far less than a normal brute force it makes it much more easier so there's a lot of things that could go wrong right we have to constantly monitor what resources are there and then see is that right same thing you know unauthenticated cloud resource here can pose significant security risk for cloud services cloud include virtual machines storage buckets databases all contain sensitive data and application vital to business operations right so here they're talking about in the previous slide we talked about s3 bucket data storage and github repositories but here we're talking about the underlying infrastructure also right they may not properly authenticate right there are certain cases where they will enable an ftp service on the instance where they want to share file put files into the system or copy files from the system and they will allow anonymous login out there uh, they might be accessing to certain services out there without any kind of an authentication right and api level also it's going to be there an api may be fetching certain information out there but it is not checking the authentication right they may be having a session management session id and things like that but in the background it is not verified whether they have access to that or not that becomes a major problem right databases or virtual machines is one of the things that comes into this right think about this is not always about actual machines where there is a data available you know this could also occur for machines which is used for testing purpose right there will be no data loss because there is no data in the server that was still out there what this guys will do is that they will gain access to a server and they start running their own processes on it they were doing some analytics of it they'll put it in your system because it is accessible out there they'll run their own there is no absolute no data loss out there there is no confidentiality there is no loss of availability also out there right but what is happening out here is the financial loss right because every process that is running for every second you're paying for that and if you don't properly protect your resource 
someone is going to run their analytics on it and then they're going to charge you for that and this we have seen this we have seen in google maps right google maps when you put up a google maps uh, in your website you have to pay for that that is not free service when you're using as a user google maps you're not paying but if you're a website owner who want to have google maps in your website you have to pay for that service and a lot of times they don't do it proper authentication and someone else will use that google map code you know authentication key in their website and they get charged and they, they are thinking i'm not getting so many uses but why is that google map i'm getting in them you know by the time they realize and make modifications it they would have lost a lot of money in that that is the main thing okay what do you think is the single most important point in the cloud environment right first thing there's a lot of things we're talking about right the priority that should be important right a lot of times we talk about hackers can gain access hackers can do this and hackers can do that i'll tell you the hackers impact on any organization probably it is going to about 2% and most of the time the data loss or the data theft is going to happen because of the employees inside out right so how do you prevent that from happening that has happened a lot of times right you have to be very careful and one example i'll give you very uh, there is one formula one team you know formula one teams are very expensive very you kind know, of uh, very complex the ideas are and things like that one guy who chief engineer he took three printouts of the drawings every day and walked out you know they were checking for pen drives documents and everything that pages they did not check they thought it is something related to work on anything he took the engine designs that was about 500 pages or anything every day he collected three pages four pages and went out there and six seven term seven to eight months down the line he had a complete document of that engine is designed which is a multi million dollar sometimes it can go up to lot you know in hundreds of million dollars the engine development is going to be there that could happen on that right so we have to understand who is given what access and how we are going to manage them right that is what we call it as identity and access management how do we identify a user and how do we access manage them right so implement offers permission based on role based access control this guarantees user access is provided based on unique position within the company decreases the possibility of one wanted access and again is multi factor authentication so for instance a role based access control it depends on a particular person's role all right so previously what used to happen is the let's assume let's assume you're working in a call center right you will let's say you're working for a call center where you're dealing with uh, customer data or uh, let's say you're working for a dell computer call center when customer is going to call you when they have some issue with their computer and they are going to talk to them and going to help them out if you see when you when they call up the customer when they give the customer id a huge information that is displayed on the the customer service executive screen it talks about what is the customer name what is the address what is his phone number what system he is having what is the serial number for that what is his service history is it the first time he is calling all that information is there but he will not be able to man, main make changes to that right if he is telling i want to make modification to that i have changed my address the call center executive will not be able to do that because he will only have his role only will have read permission for that customer data right he will not going to have any more information they then in that case you will tell i am going to forward the call to someone else who can help you out with that and probably this will go to the manager the manager will have access to that. guys can you mute your mic guys can you mute your microphone someone speaking telugu please mute in the mouth yeah i have done that no issue thank you yeah yeah so 
this is role based access control right even the managers let's say a call center manager in us should not have access to the call center uh, customer data in india and similarly an indian manager should not have access to customer data in us that is what it is supposed to be they, they may be on the same building same floor and different parts of the same floor right they should not have access to that so how do you do that is using role based access control right it's quite easy right every time a new user comes in you assign him a role and all the permissions will be assigned to him and when that person leaves the role or he's been transferred to some other role you just have to remove that particular role all the permissions will be removed if we don't go via role based access control you have to do it individually that is a very big pain in there okay that is the and make sure you have multi factor authentication you know we cannot stress enough multi factor authentication has to be used we'll keep i will keep on telling on that it plays a major role right there's a if even after multi factor authentication still people get hacked still people get duped uh that that has to be that happens a lot right still it happens so it reduces the impact right there's a better chance that you're not going to get hacked up secure your endpoints right how do you protect the infra right one thing is defense in depth uh usually what we think is that there is one network firewall and then there is a server out there is what we feel in a organization in a cloud environment or wherever it is going to be there right that is going to take care of that in reality that is not going to be the case there is a long list of appliances that has to be present before the packet or the request reaches the actual server right uh usually that happens is that there's going to be firewall right the network level firewall then again probably it will go down to another firewall which is at the uh, web application server firewall network right after that there's going to be anti malware firewall meaning it is going to check right it is going to check when you're doing any kind of a file upload or giving out there is someone sending a virus right is someone sending and attaching an email right whenever whenever you try to put an exe file in your gmail it will automatically block tell i cannot do that part, right what you do at that time you probably will zip it encrypt that zip file and then send it across gmail but if you don't do that it will never error because there is a malware anti malware server out there which is filtering everything that has been uploaded out there, right an idps system it is always looking for intrusion process and things and access control is going to take care who is having access to what and everything you know the dashboard management and everything see here that we're talking about here as a defense in depth right a much more deeper impact into looking at multiple layers right it is there is no single appliance or anything that is going to give a complete 360 degree security we always need to have more than one level of approach of the and nowadays it is getting difficult more and more right the cost of managing the services is getting really high uh one of the reasons why we see a lot of companies would go towards you know the way they they will have an online payment right but when you go for the payment they'll go for a third party payment portal something like razer pay or it could be you know some other uh, stripe or anything like that the main reason is that it is going to be very difficult because once you have the payment processing a lot of things has to be done by you according to the rule and the government rule and compliance rules that is going to be a problem right so they want to mitigate that you know take that responsibility away from their table and putting it on the other one's table of them but that is what defense in depth is going to be there for each and every layer you are going to take care do some kind of a service out there and then you are going to do that right So when you're giving an administrator a laptop, you are going to make sure that administrator laptop is encrypted. It is not having any unnecessary software or anything, right? There are companies, larger bank companies, they will never allow an employee to download any software from the internet and install it in the system, right? They'll tell we have a central repository, all the 
softwares that are used by us are properly vetted out there and we know that this is not having any virus or malware download it from here it could be microsoft office it could be even your mozilla firefox or chrome that you're downloading you can't download from the mozilla website or chrome google website you have to download it from a central repository and install it you know that is the one more layer of security that you're going to add up there and you can't connect to the internet without their VPN and every data that is going to be going out of your system is has to be monitored. Right. So no personal calls, no thing, no browsing or anything out there. Right. So they might allow YouTube and other things, but again, they will have a control about what will videos you link to that. So securing is endpoints and how we are going to secure place a huh? very important role out here. Right. Logging and monitoring security logs. Enable and monitor security logs. This is very, very important. A lot of companies, they don't take this seriously. All right. And people who have not taken it seriously have paid a huge price. Uh, there was an organization, right? They had an attack and they scanned their networks and found out they were hacked. And they got to know they were hacked four years back, right? Because they saw the logs and they analyzed the logs finally. And they saw that attacker had come into their system four years back and he has stayed there. And he has been taking data out of their network because they're losing a lot of intellectual property data. And they're wondering how their competitors are knowing what the product is going to be launched because they are launching a very similar product ahead of time with more features also. Right. So this was happening because he was hacking and capturing out there and they it went unnoticed because there was no log analytics. They were not capturing the logs or anything. Right. Is that we should also have logs for any modifications. as well, Right. If someone is deleting the data, there should be a log of there. This particular person access the server at particular time. And this is the command issued by him. Right. So if he's telling he's deleting the data, we need to have access what data was deleted by this particular person. That is very important out there, right? Again, one more pro advantage of having log monitoring is that it helps out with identify misconfiguration, right? Because some it is there, uh, certain steps which is way there, it has happened and the log we can analyze this is happening out there. And we see that, okay, this is due to misconfiguration, this functionality has been enabled, right? that is going to be there again access identifying people with access rights right changes so for instance let's say this has happened you know someone what happens is that when you create a aws instance there are multiple things you know? there are developers and there are administrators who are managing this right so operations team who are going to install all the software into this that's going to be there a developer should have a very limited access to them in some cases what happens is that they would have created a developer user out there with a, a pseudo privilege, which I think while creating, they think that was needed and later they would, was not revoked and they continue to do that. And probably they're making some modifications without proper authentication of that, right? At that time, logs also helps you out identifying what has happened. Out there. And this plays a very important role. Other. Most common security issues we face is misconfiguration uh, it is the as i told right the github repository being marked as public when it should supposed to be private that is a misconfiguration of there uh, you're not changing the default settings that is a misconfiguration out there there once what happened was in simple example a database usually will have a default username and password. It used to have. Uh, nowadays, you see it gets removed. Right. What happened was they connected to the database and hackers. They could not retrieve any data. So, but since they had the default username and password enabled, and that it was not connected to any legitimate data, they used that username and password to create a table and start populating data inside the table, right? 
they kept on sending it complete lot of data in such a way that it completely filled up the hard drive and it crashed right that is the in some cases in s3 buckets or google drive let's say you create one folder out there and keep it as public you know you think okay there's no data out there it should be fine i don't have to worry about it can i take that open that folder and push my own data in that right let's say you're you're on the you know meter basis that you're paying for every data byte that is stored out there what if if i put one terabyte of data in that part how much money are going to pay for that you have to pay for it right it's not going to be there you know how do you do those process right so are you checking for the default ports right it is there or not uh, encryption is important right i spoke about data should not be sent in plain text or stored in plain text sometimes it is also important the right set of algorithm is used right for instance if you are using an algorithm called rsa is a very good algorithm but if you are using a key size of 256 or 512 it is not secure right it can be broken you need to use a key size minimum of 2048 or 4096 4096 bit key size out there but what if the default configuration allow it to run at 512 or 1024 right you did not make that configuration changes to do changes into that part right you have to see it in that part so one way to look at how do you make sure that you are not providing default configuration is to understand what are the things that is been out there and cs benchmark is a very important tool for you where it will help you with the services right it will tell this particular service should be disabled if you are not running it will give you a huge and comprehensive checklist telling that these are the things that is supposed to be not being active or that if you don't have this service running right they should you know uh, how do you overcome never use default permissions uh, understand who is they giving what access to that lot of times when a user is created they get created as admin user and then they will do it you know downgrade it that should not happen uh, personally config each bucket or group of buckets check out who is having access right for this all that right uh, and then again who's, you should also know constantly interact with the team about how do you set up the addresses for this configuration of the resources of that right so we see so many issues are coming out here correct right? so so many issues that are there in the cloud that has an huge impact but how do we overcome this situation what are the things that need to be taken so we saw what are the things that could go wrong till now but what are the things that needs to be done by us you know that plays a very important role so solution is mandate a company wide training it is important that we initiate security training for the, all the employees in the organization uh, nowadays we see a lot of organization having security trainings either virtual or in person someone comes up and gives a training about it uh, that happens out there uh, but that needs to be go further right uh, they are giving just security awareness training for the team but they don't talk about technical security training out there right how does this uh, server admin improve the security of a server what are the things that need to be done by them what are the security features the developers need to be done that has to be taken into consideration right deploy multiple instances right you should have a network based firewall you should have a web application firewall web application firewall is different than a network firewall right in a network firewall it talks only about uh, you know what packet what is the source address destination port number only but a wap is much more sophisticated it goes much deeper into each of the packets where it look at the data that you have entered right when you sign up when you put your name username at gmail.com that is actually checked by wap whether have you entered the right name or not or is any code into that right uh, then again monitor the key enterprise cloud applications this should be done especially for the because it may be costly affair if you're doing it for everything but we have to make sure that the key let's say 
if you're having 10 servers and you're using three servers for production and other seven servers are used for testing purpose and things probably you can go less on monitoring or logging in this seven servers but have a full monitoring on the production three production servers. something you have to look into that implement a zero trust model where you don't trust anything you're not trusting a user will make sure that he's not using his laptop for wrong things you are going to think that he might be using the laptop for wrong things how we are going to go with that from that approach is what we have to think is that you know uh, regularly patch your systems software updates try to do it quite often and things like that constantly if you're using a specific tools or like ubuntu or python they will have their own security portals where they'll discuss about what are the latest vulnerability how can it be patched so look out for that constantly monitor them and work on that use multi-factor authentication sms is no longer safe because there's a limitation to that then again if your mobile phone is hacked again it is going to be an issue right uh, app-based multi-factor authentication is much better it is used and then again check which user is having what access to what policies right access management this has to be uh periodically identify audit data buckets and permission sets. meaning this is very important that we constantly check which user is having access and whether that user is present in the organization or if he's present is his role changed or has been moved to different team but is still having access to the old team data all those things has to be checked it's a regular audit it part of the security compliance team where check whether the user access given to that user is right or wrong the managers will be responsible for checking this regularly right then again so securing a secure development life cycle making sure security is being set up in the software development life cycle only right that is the uh, automated tools to manage life cycle for the account permissions and things there's a lot of tools nowadays you're getting it is getting security tools are maturing it much more better these days uh, providers cloud service providers also provide a lot of tools that for doing this out there and you'll also have a lot of security software composition composition analysis tools also which are much more accurate than before right a paid ones are much more better they have much more the free ones are also good but the point is that they may be delayed with that with that actual data what they have for instance uh, it may be delayed by four to five days or sometimes 10 days but sometimes that can be a big now big big gap someone can do hack your system in the meantime right and above all in the last and make sure how do you know your solution is working right or wrong they've implemented all the security features known to you and how do you know is your security is working is your system secure or not we only know when we audit the system when we pen test when you're doing vulnerability analysis of this infrastructure and services we'll know whether it's working or not so that should be there without doing a pen testing or a cloud a vulnerability analysis your security journey is incomplete and all of this all of these steps has to go on a loop right has to go on a loop meaning you're continuously doing this you're mandating you're not it's not that you don't train someone today and then forget no every once in six months or once in a year the security training has to happen on there you have to keep on checking your WAF is there and everything software development life cycle every time you're developing a software you have to make sure you're managing out there you're constantly checking for patches you're constantly checking is there any vulnerability in your third party tools you know you're constantly pen testing and you're constantly checking whether accounts having any access permission or not it is a non-stop and it is goes on an infinite loop till the application is alive or the services is alive or that okay so so this again as i told it becomes a difficult scenario for us for small organization medium organization to manage services security it becomes so many things are there right they may not have the budget to all those things out there and they still have to secure the product so 
what happens is this cloud service providers are coming up with security as a service where it will have a pre you know at one for you to help you out with that part right so previously we had to install our waf and WAF firewall network firewall manually and things like that nowadays you don't have to worry about that it can be done by a cloud service provider one thing is when you take it as a service it is going to be coming a lot cheaper right one example we have seen is cloudfare waf it comes out a lot cheaper than having an on prem or a dedicated waf out there right it helps us reduce the price because it comes around i think 5 dollars or 10 dollars per month for small organization for small website is excellent you know but for large and things they can have you know that they need a much more streamlined approach to that access to security experts we are seeing we are seeing nowadays they come in for a day or two they look into that what is there and uh, you know uh, help you out with that part and then go they go right that is rather than having a dedicated person sitting in and this is going to be expensive because security job openings are quite expensive especially these days when there's a huge demand and the availability of proper security professionals is less it is very difficult to get good quality so experts easy to access them uh, these tools will also help you out with security tools and updates so what can be done what action can be done which tool and there's a lot of explanation out there and it becomes easier to faster provision let's say you have want a waf if you have to do it yourself you have to create an aws instance you have to install waf you have to configure it and do all those things it will take time if security as a service is there you just have to click on it couple of buttons click on this and that and it will be implemented out there, right and it is more easier to manage it because they'll have a dashboard and everything out there right without that you have to manually managing it it's going to be in hell and we are seeing it i'm seeing in a lot of my clients where they moved to on-prem meaning they're in they removed the server from aws to their local office and they're struggling really bad because there are a lot of management tools are not there available out there and they have to do a lot of things manually right so it is actually increasing the their response time to a lot of issues and things and they're planning to go back to the aws now so but it becomes an issue right and and that marks an end to our uh, four weeks cyber security awareness and cyber security pen testing deed on uh, devsecops and cloud security you know so, you know internship program so if anyone having any doubts guys please reach out speak up Thank you, Mr. Kartik, uh, for this wonderful day and wonderful session. So, guys, after this, we do have a DevOps session also. Mr. Devas is, is kind of ready uh, before we uh, in because we are going to use the same meeting link. So, those who wants to join, uh, please stay on this call. So, we do have some uh, urge like uh, things to share. Our cyber security is main course or job ready course that is the consist of a uh, six weeks monday to friday uh, daily two hours uh, five days in a week and uh, unfortunately we can have only six session in a whole year so that uh, the next batch is going to start from october's first week october 2nd it is a limited seat it is a the, we do have a threshold of our students a number of students that we can take only you know 10 number of students in a one batch uh, sorry for that because uh, most of the time our uh, students ask that uh, after registrations complete they would like to join but unfortunately we cannot because more 80 percent of our course are hands-on right so to make every uh, make sh make it sure that every students are getting the individual you know cares and we are you know have the enough time and to resolve their individual issues along with the, those projects so we cannot take more than 10 people or else we'll lose the our course integrity so already a few students have completed their registration uh, i think the link is live from last one two or three days before so those who wants to join uh, one quick request don't wait for the last day 
there is a 90% uh, assurance that it will be closed far before the end date. If you have any doubts uh, about our job training, how to do uh, complete the registration, what is the course content, how the thing is uh, done, you can ask me and uh, Mr. Kartik is also here. You can come uh, ask anything about our job training to the main trainer as well. So yes, uh, we'll have another 10 minutes to attend any question regarding job market or your job ready training or your interview experience about our uh, certificates. Yes, some uh, person also mark the one question. How the uh, one uh, Mirza asked how the practical sessions will be conducted. Yes, so practical session will set up a lab on your desktop. Uh, in our DevOps classes, we normally use AWS, but in our cyber security classes as cloud infrastructure will not allow to do the print, print test or um, kind of uh, hacking stuff. So we have to use virtual machine. So our trainer will share all those you know details with you and they will set up a lab on your personal laptop. So that's uh, you know you will have a complete lab with you throughout the course and after the course as well for a further practice. Yes, correct. So because you will be uh, when it comes to Linux and pen testing that we will be going much deeper into web application hacking. What are the things how to hack into that? So it may not be a good idea to use why AWS because AWS have some restrictions on what tools and when you're sending malicious code online, it's not allowed with that you know, it will against the policy for AWS. So we're doing labs out there. And again, for DevSecOps also, we are again, we're having Ubuntu based labs where we're using Jenkins uh, to set up the entire environment and we'll see how to set up the tools and how to scan all those things will be done out there. Any more question? Sure. Yeah, Karthik, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah that, that's it, that's it. So uh, only please guys don't wait for the last date because after now our the registration is over and the classes started, uh, we are kind of, uh, you know, helpless, become a little bit helpless to uh, allow uh, for, uh, more than 10 students in one batch. I think I have uh, also shared some of our, uh, you know, number, WhatsApp number in the group, and that is that number is already pinned. So if you have any doubt, you can or uh, any uh, assistance during the course registration, or uh, if you know further about the uh, our job ready trainings, you can ping there, and our team members they are going to help you. Mm -hmm.